are in listen only mode. Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Shirlin Chen from Aboringa Ingohan and I will be your moderator for today's webinar that is organized by the Gastro Plus user group. Today's presentation is titled Gastro Plus Modeling as a Tool to Ensure Target Performance of a Generic Drug Product. This presentation will be given by Dr. Yasmina Novikovic from Aptex Inc. A pharmacist by training, Yasmina holds PhD degrees in analytical chemistry, Charles University, Prague, and in pharmaceutical chemistry, University of Belgrade, Serbia. She joined Apotex Inc., a Canadian pharmaceutical company in 2007, and in her current role, Yasmina is responsible for biopharmaceutical modeling and simulations to support product development and life cycle management. In addition to her primary employment, Yasmina teaches pharmaceutical subjects in Seneca College and the Canadian Academy of Natural Health. She is an author or co-author of over 20 scientific publications and has been an invited speaker at numerous scientific events, including this year's AAPS webinar in March and the recent FDA public workshop on oral absorption modeling and simulation in May. Also participating as a panelist today is Dr. Viera Lukchova from Simulations Plus. Viera is the team leader for simulation technologies and also serves as the Gastro Plus product manager. Viera will be available to answer questions related to the Gastro Plus program. Following the presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. You may either send your question using the questions pane on your control panel, or you may ask your question directly using the hand raising icon. If you are using a telephone to listen to the call, please be sure to enter the unique audio pane displays, uh, displayed when you join the call. This enables us to unmute your line so that we can hear you. This webinar will be recorded and it will be available to the user group members in the future. So without further ado, we now begin the webinar presentation. Yes, Nina? Uh, thank you, Sherwin, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, John and Viera, uh, for your support. And special thanks to GastroPlus user group for the opportunity to talk about GastroPlus modeling and simulations as a tool to ensure target performance of a generic drug product. Now I would like to move, but I cannot for some reason. Okay, that's okay now. Uh, in the generic industry, the objective is to, well, to develop a formulation process uh, that would result in the product performance equivalent of the reference listed drug or innovator's product throughout the product life cycle. Uh, this is a simplified scheme taken from the literature illustrating a major step of generic drug product development. Uh, development starts with characterization of the reference product followed by design of the generic drug product and process. And for simplicity, these two stages I would call development stages in this presentation. Once the product and process are developed, we are subjecting our generic drug products to pivotal bio studies against innovators' products. And if the outcome of bio study is favorable, uh, then commercial manufacturing may start it. Uh, these stages are called in my presentation post-development stages for simplicity. So I shall talk about the roles of physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling and simulations at the development stage and post-development stage. Uh, for both stages, I shall provide two examples. Example one and two are for development stage and examples three and four for post-development stage. 
Uh, during development stage, our major focus is to characterize reference listed drug and to establish target product performance. Uh, also, we are identifying critical material attributes of active pharmaceutical ingredient and we are supporting, by doing modeling and simulation at the development stage, we are supporting formulation design and product development uh, to achieve bioequivalence with reference listed drug. Once bioequivalence is achieved uh, and commercial manufacturing starts, uh, at the development stages, uh, we are using bioindicative dissolution test conditions and clinically relevant specification limits to support changes during post-development. Uh, also, we are identifying critical material attributes and boundaries uh, for excipients. Uh, in most of the situations, it is polymer that controls release. And eventually, uh, we are developing level A IVIVC based on physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling that we can use for biowaver stratification. Now I'm starting part one of my presentation, which is about modeling and simulation at the development stage. At the development stage, objective is to characterize reference listed drug and define parameters for the performance that becomes target for the product development. We call it quality target product profile QTPP. Our methodology is to use modeling to reveal in vivo absorption profile for a solid dosage form, reference listed drug in this case, followed by series of simulations to identify critical material attributes, CMA, or critical process parameter, CPP. Uh, for examples, I will have a BCS4 and BCS2 drugs formulated as immediate release solid oral dosage forms. So our resources are GastroPlus, we are using GastroPlus software version 8. As an input info, we are using physical, chemical, and PK properties of active pharmaceutical ingredient. Uh, we have to know dosage form and dosage strength, routes of administration, uh, API solubility profile across physiologically relevant pH range, plasma concentration versus time data, or pharmacokinetics parameter uh, for reference listed drug. So if the full profile is available, uh, we are taking it from the literature. If it is not available, we are relying on the PK parameters that have been reported by the innovator. And also, we can use in vitro dissolution or release profiles, um, but it is not mandatory. It is optional. My example one is a BCS4 drug, a steroid structure. Uh, drug is formulated as immediate release tablet, 250 mg dosage strength. Uh, molecular weight and molecular formula are known to us, as well as physical chemical parameters such as log D, PKA, and KCO2 permeability is known to us. Uh, for pH solubility profile, we generated in-house data. And PK parameters such as Cmax, Tmax, AUC, volume of distribution, total body clearance, plasma protein binding have been reported in the literature. Uh, based on the parameters, uh, we are able to simulate plasma concentration versus time profile in the case that it is not available in the literature. And also, we had in vitro dissolution profile, but in this situation, it had been used for information purposes only. Uh, this slide represents a pH solubility profile of the active pharmaceutical ingredient across physiologically relevant pH range. And we can see that a drug is low soluble. A solubility is pH dependent. A decrease of solubility is observed as pH is increasing, <clears throat> but <clears throat> when we calculated so-called uh, dose uh, solubility volume ratio, it was above 250 across the whole pH range. 
and it tells us that the drug is classified according to BCS criteria as a low solubility drug. Also, we had in-house data of solubility in surfactant, and the data showed significant increase in solubility in the presence of surfactant. So we, <coughs> excuse me, so we incorporated all the information into uh, GastroPlus, and uh, we created a model uh, for the drug, reference-listed drug. The output is a simulated profile, which is a line, and um, this is plotted against the observed profile represented by empty squares. Uh, we see big discrepancy between the observed and simulated profile, and although all the parameters were correct, so we questioned ourselves uh, what was the reason uh, for that big difference. And um, by starting to approach this problem, uh, we uh, recall so-called parsimony principle that says that among multiple hypotheses, uh, the simplest one is most likely to be the correct one. Uh, so we modeled solubility by knowing that solubility is dramatically increased in the presence of the factant, we model solubility across pH range. And uh, the blue line uh, represents model solubility. Uh, the red line in this slide is experimental solubility. And note that uh, the scale is semi lux space. Scale. So there is dramatic difference between uh, modeled and experimental solubility. Our next step was to incorporate the model solubility into GastroPlus model, and as a result, we got almost ideal matching uh, between simulated uh, profile presented by uh, full line and observed profile presented by empty squares. Uh, so, based on this, we defined our formulation strategy. Our formulation strategy is solubility enhancement. We have to fill that gap between experimental solubility and model solubility. Uh, so, based on that, uh, we managed to achieve a bioequivalence with this drug product. Now I'm going to talk about our example two. Our example two is a BCS2 anti-cancer drug. And this is similar scenario as input info. Uh, we used dosage, form, dosage, strength. Uh, this time this drug is formulated in two different dosage strengths. And by definition, a high dosage strength is the strength that has to be tested for bioequivalence unless there are some safety concerns. And then we have, of course, molecular formula and molecular weight for the active pharmaceutical ingredient. Uh, physical chemical properties have been known to us as well as effective permeability. Uh, solubility profile across physiologically relevant uh, pH range has been generated in-house, and the PK parameters such as volume of distribution, total body clearance, blood plasma concentration ratio, plasma protein binding has been reported by the innovator. And this time, uh, we knew plasma concentration versus time profile since we have conducted pilot bio study uh, that resulted in an uh, outcome that had not been favorable. I shall talk a little bit more about that later. And we also had in vitro dissolution profile that we used for information only. The reason why in vitro dissolution profiles were used for information only is that it is not always the case to have in vitro dissolution that has bioindicated potential. So this is API pH solubility profile across physiologically relevant pH range. And this drug is based on the solubility classified as BCS2 drug. Uh, but when we calculated uh, those solubility volume, uh, it tells us that the drug is actually highly soluble in the acidic media, 
and low soluble in uh, media of higher pH. Uh, as per default, when we have drug with low solubility, uh, we want to match uh, reference listed product and we are afraid that our product uh, is going to underperform because of low solubility. And at this time, uh, we micronize our uh, active pharmaceutical ingredient and we manufactured our trial batch that uh, has been subjected to biostudy with micronized material. So, our biostudy, uh, I forgot to tell, our biostudy results were on high side. It means that our product did not meet bioequivalence criteria uh, because of high uh, test reference AUC and CMAX ratios. Uh, so when trying to figure out what would be the reason for that, uh, we did series of simulation by varying particle size of the active ingredient. In this slide, um, you see observed PK profile for the reference product, which is represented by the MP squares and simulated PK profile for the reference product obtained by using all the parameters and varying particle size. Since we do not know what was uh, the particle size uh, for the API incorporated into Innovator's product, we started with default value of 25 micrometers for the radius and our simulated profile uh, was on high side. And then, okay, it might be indicator and that particle size is a critical material attribute. So then we decrease uh, particle size. The following simulation shows profile of, simulated profile of reference listed product with particle size of five micrometers. And uh, it, sees, it shows bigger discrepancy between the observed and simulated. So we realized that we have to go to higher particle size. We did it with particle size of, of 30 micrometers and 50 micrometers. And we concluded that the problem with our formulation and that um, exhibited by inequivalence on the higher side uh, was a too small particle size because we micronize our material. Now I am going to move uh, to second part of my presentation, uh, which is about modeling and simulation at post-development stage. At post-development stages, we already have bioequivalent product, and we would like to evaluate impact of changes, such as additional strength or changes to the formulation and process on product performance by implementing adequate control strategies. Our methodology is to use bioindicative test methods to establish, if possible, a level A IVIVC and to set up clinically meaningful acceptance criteria. As examples, I will use two drugs. One is BCS1 and another is BCS3 drug. Both are formulated as extended release matrix-based solid oral dosage forms. So our resources uh, for post-development stage are GastroPlus version 8. As input info, we have a physical, chemical, and PK properties of active pharmaceutical ingredients. We have PK profiles for immediate release or intravenous formulation, if available. We have PK profiles for extended release formulations, ideally formulations exhibiting three release rates, slow, medium, and fast. And we have in vitro release profiles for slow, medium, and fast formulations generated by bioindicative dissolution method. Uh, my example number three is a BCS 
class one drug formulated as extended release tablet. Our product uh, is um, formulated in multiple strengths and has a linear pharmacokinetics. Bioequivalence versus reference product is proven for the lowest and highest strengths. Biostudy has been conducted for IR formulation in the past. Formulations subjected to biostudies exhibited different release rates in one of the test media. Test media is the solution test media. Is this relevant to the product in vivo performance? It was the question. Because of that difference, biowaver justification, conventional biowaver justification, which is based on comparison of the dissolution profiles uh, in different media and F2 calculation, is challenge. It wasn't accessible uh, from the regulatory point of view. Then we ask ourselves if a science-based approach that employs modeling and simulation applicable. So these are our in-house resources or PK profiles uh, for immediate release formulation, the blue one. And then for extended release formulations of various strengths, uh, this uh, slide or this plot is not those normalized. So we have the lower strength, which is represented by purple line and empty squares. And we have uh, two formulations of the highest dosage strengths represented by red and green line. Purple formulation, low dosage strength, and green formulation, high dosage strength, they were bi-equivalent. And red formulation, the highest dosage strength, was bi-equivalent, but on borderline. Uh, actually, that formulation um, uh, had problem with confidence interval. Confidence interval uh, for pharmacokinetic parameters were on the low side. And so, by knowing that, uh, we actually knew that we have a good starting point to develop level A IVIVC because we had uh, formulations with different release rate exhibiting bioequivalence with reference listed product. Uh, we had immediate release formulation, which was important for us as a source uh, to derive uh, PK parameters for the modeling. So we started model development. As input information, we used physical chemical properties of the active ingredient, in-house solubility data, in-house plasma concentration versus time data for immediate release formulation, and PK parameters that were derived from immediate release formulation. So we incorporated those PK parameters later on when we modeled extended release formulation. Our modeling for immediate release formulation was successful, uh, which is evidenced by the overlay of simulated profile uh, represented by full line and observed profile represented by empty square for immediate release tablet. Based on the model, uh, we learned um, what is the regional gastrointestinal absorption profile uh, for this drug, which is BTS1 drug, formulated as extended release tablet. Uh, you can see that being BCS class 1 drug, uh, this molecule is completely absorbed, uh, almost 100%, in this case 93 point something, has been absorbed, and absorption occurs along gastrointestinal tract. Uh, the major site of absorption is um, duodenum with pH of about 6. Uh, so based on that, we concluded that uh, for our uh, drug product, we need in vitro release method, which would reflect, if possible, in vivo uh, pH of in vivo medium, 
when, observe, uh, where, where absorption occurs. Uh, so that helps us to establish bioindicative in vitro dissolution test method. And on the right side, you see dissolution profiles uh, for three extended release formulations generated using bioindicative test conditions that have been identified based on the modeling. And on the left side, uh, you see PK profiles uh, for the three extended release formulations without those normalizations. Uh, based on the data, uh, we managed to establish in vitro in vivo correlation level A, uh, which resulted in a linear relationship between a fraction of drug released in vitro and fraction of drug absorbed in vivo. As requested by the regulatory guidances, uh, we did validation of our level A IVC, and all the parameters uh, were within the acceptance criteria. Uh, the acceptance criteria for this type of IVIVC are the same regardless of the approach, if it is a convolution, deconvolution approach of uh, physiologically based PK modeling doesn't really matter. Acceptance criteria are always the same. It is important to have a prediction error and that is less than 10% mean prediction error for each parameter or individual prediction error can be maximum um, 15%. In this case, uh, we had a prediction error for each individual parameter below 10%. And as such, we consider our IVIVC level A validated. So once when we have a level A IVIVC, it provides latitude for many applications. Based on level A IVIVC, we establish clinically relevant specification limits for bioindicative dissolution test conditions to ensure bioequivalence. Uh, we created biostudy waiver for the intermediate strengths, and we justified scale-up and post-approval changes. And also, uh, we defined boundaries for critical material attributes of a rate-controlling excipient to ensure in vivo release within clinically relevant specification limits. So I shall guide you uh, through all these three points. Let's start with A, which is a specification limit for bioindicative dissolution test. Uh, to establish this, we did a series of simulations uh, conducted to predict PK parameters for hypothetical batches exhibiting different in vitro release profiles. Acceptance criteria are proposed based on the simulation results to ensure discrimination between bioequivalent and borderline bioequivalent batches. And the proposed acceptance criteria were in agreement with the actual data for the borderline batch. Borderline batch is that batch that is marginally outside the limit uh, because of the confidence interval. So this slide uh, presents in more detail uh, our approach. So we have upper and lower limits. These limits are represented by uh, dotted um, red lines. And we have borderline batch, that batch that passed, uh, but, uh, passed with mean values for test reference ratios for CMAX and AUC but failed because of the confidence interval on the low side. So borderline batch is marginally outside the acceptance criteria. And also to be on a safe side, we introduce so-called gray area. Uh, that gray, gray area uh, accommodates prediction error. So it was first application of our IV IVC. A second application, I put letter B for that one, 
is biostudy waiver uh, for intermediate tracks. In vitro release profiles uh, were generated for intermediate strengths using bioindicative test method, and those profiles are incorporated into simulation to predict PK profiles for intermediate strengths. And then we calculated pest reference ratios uh, for CMAX and AUC, uh, and it gives us confidence in that our intermediate strengths are bioequivalent when, um, when given at the same dose. Uh, drug is with linear pharmacokinetics, so it allows extrapolation from one strength to another strength. And third application of level A IVIVC is um, to create or define boundaries for critical material attributes of re release controlling polymer. A polymer material may have impact on the release of the active ingredient and consequently on the bioviability. So we ask ourselves what are the boundaries of the polymer critical material attributes. And logically, boundaries should be defined to ensure bioequivalence. And bioequivalence is ensured by clinically meaningful acceptance limits for bioindicative dissolution test method. So by knowing that, uh, our reasoning was the following. Ultimate goal is to assure bioequivalence or bioviability. By implementing clinically relevant specification uh, for the bioindicative test method, in this case it was in vitro release test method, the solution method, the release is controlled by the polymer and therefore boundaries are defined by the product ability to meet clinically relevant specification when tested using bioindicative in vitro release method. Now I am switching to our example number four, uh, which is a BCS3 drug uh, exhibiting site-specific absorption and nonlinear pharmacokinetics. Our product is uh, formulated as extended release matrix, matrix based formulation in two different strengths. Bioequivalence has been proven for both strengths, but changes have been made to the manufacturing process for one strength. And according to the regulatory requirements, type of changes is unacceptable for a conventional biostudy waiver. A conventional biostudy waiver is biostudy waiver based on comparison of the solution profiles. So our objective was to ensure that quality target product profile is unaffected by the changes. We had the following information generated in-house. Uh, we had in vivo plasma concentration versus time profiles uh, for slow, medium, and fast formulations of 1,000 milligram dosage strength. Uh, we had data uh, for immediate release formulation, 1,000 milligram dosage strength. We had pre-changed drug product, 500 milligram dosage strength. For that one, uh, we conducted bio study. Um, but as I mentioned, we made changes uh, to 500 milligram dosage strength only, and we could not justify those changes because they were outside of the scope of the regulatory requirements. We, of course, have in vitro release data generated using bioindicative test methods for slow, medium, and fast formulation of 1,000 milligram dosage strength. And we also did the same for pre- and post-change uh, drug product of 500 milligram dosage strength, 
this time uh, we did it of course for the single tablet but we also did it uh, for two tablets per vessel because we wanted to mimic as much as possible 1000 milligram dosage strength. The reason for that is nonlinear pharmacokinetics of the drug. This slide represents uh, PK profiles for immediate release, which is blue line, uh, slow, medium, and fast formulations. Slow formulation is the red one, a medium formulation is the purple one, and fast formulation is the green one. A slow formulation uh, wasn't bioequivalent. For that formulation, test reference ratio of the uh, parameters critical for evaluation of bioequivalence was about 0.6 or 60%. For medium formulation, bioequivalence had been achieved and test reference ratio was about 0.93. And for the fast formulation also, bioequivalence has been achieved with test reference ratio of about 1.06. So we had immediate release formulation, which was important for the model development. Uh, we had uh, three extended release formulations with a different release rate, and we were pretty much confident and that uh, we have a good material to establish level A IV, IVC. Uh, so we started in the same way as we did in our previous example. We started with model development, which is based on the physical chemical parameters, in-house pH solubility data, uh, pharmacokinetic properties reported in the literature, such as plasma protein binding, blood plasma concentration ratio, and effective permeability. And the PK parameters that have been derived from our immediate release formulation. Uh, so on the right side of this slide, you see plot representing a PK profile of immediate release formulation observed in actual study, uh, which is uh, empty, represented by empty squares, and simulated PK profile represented by a full line. And there is a good agreement between the observed and simulated PK profiles. So we, we have considered that we have a good, uh, that our information is good enough uh, to go towards development of IV, IVC. However, uh, our IV, IVC uh, showed Nonlinear relationship between fraction in vitro released and fraction in vivo absorbed. This drug does not have systemic mm, metabolism. So uh, what is absorbed uh, in vivo is actually uh, detected in systemic circulation. So we can say that fraction absorbed is equal fraction absorbed by viability. Um, that nonlinear relationship is attributed to saturable site-specific absorption. And as such, a classical level A IV, IVC uh, was not feasible. And the literature reports the same observations uh, for this type of molecule. Uh, however, by using a PBPK modeling, uh, we managed to establish level A IV IVC to validate it and to apply it to predict PK profiles uh, for pre and post change batches, assuming administration at the same dose level, which was two times 500 milligrams equal 1000 milligrams. We had to stick to one dose level due to nonlinear pharmacokinetics. And as I mentioned previously, we were lucky to have sufficient amount of information for 1,000 uh, dosage track. Uh, so impact of the changes is assessed by comparing uh, PK parameters predicted for pre- and post-change patches.
In the summary, I would like to say that at development stage, a PBPK modeling is a proven tool to characterize reference listed drug, define target product profile for, pro for product performance, and formulation strategy for product development. At post-development stage, a PBPK modeling is a tool to identify bioindicative test methods and establish adequate control strategies. Uh, level A IVIVC developed using PBPK modeling is employed to assess impact of changes, such as additional strengths, changes in the product or process, on, pro on drug product by viability by equivalence. Uh, at the end, I would like to provide a list of uh, references that I found useful for the preparation of this presentation as well as for my work. And thank you very much for your attention. Questions? Thank you very much. Jasmina for the great presentation. Um, at this point, we will open up for questions. Um, as mentioned earlier, that, uh, if you do have a question, you could um, 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 type in your question using the questions pen on your control panel. You can also um, um, ask your question directly using the hand raising icon. Um, now I saw the questions coming in. I will uh, start um, right now. Um, the first question for uh, Yasmina. For example one, have you used the solubility in the presence of the surfactant as the solubility input? Uh, actually, the model solubility, which was the, the maximum solubility that could be achieved based on pKa. And by knowing that in the presence of surfactant, solubility is dramatically increased, uh, we came to the conclusion that we have to use some solubilization approach in order to enhance bioviability of our drug. So it was a model solubility based on pKa of the molecule, um, but information on the solubility in the presence of surfactant was useful uh, to um, direct us towards that approach. Thank you. The next question, how relevant is to generate in vitro bio-relevant dissolution profile of innovator product? during the development stage of generic pharmaceutical dosage form and they use it as the input for the PBPT modeling? Uh, that is a very good question and actually uh, it is a sort of um, big issue because how relevant it is, it depends on the type of the formulation. Sometimes innovator is using a different uh, technology, for example, osmotic pump, uh, instead of uh, application of polymer to achieve controlled release. And in some situations, we are aware and we have such experience um, that uh, innovators profile and uh, dissolution profile and uh, dissolution profile for generic product, they could be dramatically different. Uh, but generic product might have been proven to be bioequivalent in clinical studies. Uh, so, ideally, if the mechanism behind release, if we are talking about control release formulations, is the same, then it makes sense uh, to compare uh, innovators product uh, with um, generic product or, or vice versa. Uh, regarding immediate release formulation, we may expect to have a better match between uh, innovators product and a generic product because there is no, uh, for e immediate release formulation, there is no uh, special technology involved in release 
of the active ingredient? So the answer is yes and no, depends on the situation. Sometimes it could be misleading and sometimes it could be helpful. Next question. Did you build IVFC model based on PPPK ACAD model? Uh, sorry, could you repeat it? Uh, did I build a IVFC? Did build, yeah, did you build IVFC model based on the PPPK ACAD model? Yes, yes. For second compound, uh, which is BCS uh, class 3 drug, uh, with site-specific absorption and nonlinear pharmacokinetics, it was the only option. Uh, for the BCS1 drug, it could be both. Okay, thank you. Next question. Have the IV IVCs been approved by any regulatory authority? Yes, um, IV IVC for the BCS class one, my example number three, had been approved. Uh, for example number four, which is BCS class three compound, it is under review. Great, thanks. The next question, can we use IV IVC for FDC products? Uh, uh, sorry, which type of product? FDC products. My guess is it means fixed dose combination product. Oh, yeah. fixed yeah, dose combination so. products. Uh, I, I, I see no reason why not if all the criteria are met. In that situation, we actually have to have two models. One model for, or if there are two compounds in the product, we have to have model for each compound because those compounds are distinct molecular structures and they have distinct pharmacokinetics. So we have to develop two models. Um, I, I'd like to add to that that you, know, you would either go route of developing, so we would be developing two models for the for the two compounds but depending on how the compounds are metabolized and their pharmacokinetics, you may or may not have to consider a potential for drug-drug interactions. So if they are um, completely independent, it would be a simple process of treating them as two independent compounds. If they are affecting each other, you might need to consider drug-drug interactions in that as well. Correct, yeah. Thank you. I haven't experienced such case yet. The next question, did you add compartmental PK model with default ACAN model in case of BCS4 drug? Uh, BCS4 drug? Uh, uh, yes, uh, for that one, uh, I did modeling using compartmental approach in order to identify uh, intercompartmental constants and also uh, at this uh, stage I don't think that um, uh, because it was early stage still early stage we are trying to identify critical material attributes uh, I think it's okay to to approach it in any way Compartmental or non-compartmental analysis or combination. Thank you. Next question is uh, um, from uh, Amitava from uh, Sandoz. Um, the question is for the BCS2 molecule, why was particle size BSD sensitivity not explored before the pilot by equivalence study? Oh, yeah, that is a good question because uh, simply sometimes because of the lack of time, that is question also about what, what was raised by some other people within the company, but sometimes um, you are doing things believing that you are on the right track and then when you get results back, then you see that you missed something. 
so this is a case when we learned from our error. But it is a good comment, yeah, that is something that should have been done. Thank you. The next question. Um, it is noticed that you have used the in-house data for some parameters. Was it because of lack of literature data? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, we always believe if we have inner resources that we should use inner resources, if available. Because that is something that uh, has been generated on the population that is matching a, a population that is subjected to our um, bio-studies. Because not necessarily all the literature data uh, would be generated in the same population or similar population. So once in the past uh, when we used uh, literature data because we did not have in-house data for immediate release formulation, that is example and that has not been included in this presentation, uh, the regulator had asked to justify um, usage of the data from the literature, so we had to do some uh, deeper search to identify population characteristics of the subjects that were involved in that study in order to uh, show that it was appropriate to use the data from the literature. So nothing is bad with using data from the literature, but if we have in-house data and uh, we are 100% sure about population characteristics, uh, then we prefer to use in-house data. Thank you. Um, the next question is specifically about slide number 19, example, uh, in example 2. What was the particle size of your final bioequivalent formulation? Uh, okay. of microns? We came to the conclusion that particle size should be, particle size radius should be uh, 50 micrometers. Uh, but uh, that is what we concluded for the innovators product. Uh, but for our product, uh, uh, we decided uh, to go towards certain strategies that would uh, lead us uh, to decrease solubility, because our problem was too high solubility. Next question. Um for most of the BCS class 4 molecule, it is challenging to develop bioinductive um, bio methods. And in case the generic uses alternative um, API form, what is your suggestion for doing simulations? Uh, for BCS4, uh, in terms of uh, product that is formulated as control release or immediate release formulation. Uh, um, also, uh, I'm not sure that I understood the question completely. My BCS4 example was for immediate release formulation and that had been subjected to bio study pilot bio study and then uh, upon receiving the data uh, we went back into characterization of the reference listed product. So we had not established a bioindicative dissolution test method. Uh, to establish bioindicative dissolution test method we have to have uh, multiple studies as I illustrated in examples three and four. We had at least three studies for the same type of formulation and then with the biodata. And then uh, by comparing the biodata and in vitro data, uh, we might say this is bioindicative test method. Um, but by having only one study, it is difficult to say. Um, Yasmina, let me just sort of clarify this question. I, I think that um, it is asked. In case of generic uses alternative API form, um, if a different API form is used, so what's, what's the suggestion for doing simulation? I, I'm, I'm, 
different APA form, depending on what, what does it mean different? Is it a different polymorphic form with different solubility profile? Or yes, is it that's, that's, yeah, let's assume that it may have different um, solubilities. Different solubility. Uh, in that case, we have to incorporate solubility of our material. Let's say, for example, generic industry is using a different polymorphic form or any other form with different solubility. And then that is the solubility that is incorporated into the modeling. And then based, because this is the parameter that might be a critical material attribute, and then uh, based on the impact of solubility of the drug performance, uh, we can assess if that polymorphic form is, let's say, appropriate or inappropriate for formulation design. That is how I see it, but in my modeling, I did not have a such situation. But it is simply material which has a certain attribute different um, than the material used by the innovator. And then we should be focused on that attribute, which is Solubility as, in most of the situations, solubility as consequence of different polymorphic form. I don't know if I explain it. Yeah, thank you. Um, the next question, was the virtual BE bioequivalent analysis conducted using the models to investigate the success of the BE study? Virtual bioequivalence, no, we did not conduct it virtual bioequivalence. Uh, uh, our requirement was to develop model based on the individual subject's data. Uh, since the studies have been conducted in-house and we had individual subject's data, uh, so we incorporated that uh, variability into the model by developing model using individual subject data. And we were not requested, not yet, to conduct virtual and bioviability bioequivalent studies. I guess that it makes sense if the model is developed using mean data exclusively, and then that variability has to be incorporated at later stage, which is a population simulation. That is how I see it, but uh, I cannot say for sure. M maybe Vera can comment on that. Um, what we have done so far on the studies, uh, it depended on the, uh, the focus of the study. We have done um, one that went into the regulatory agencies and was focused on the BE, specifically evaluating bioequivalence of different formulations. So in that case, we were developing or running virtual bioequivalence uh, study. But um, I guess it depends on at which stage of the model development you are, whether you are focusing on just the IVIVC or if you then extend it to the full bioequivalence simulation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both. Um, the next question, in modeling the pH solubility profile, what, what are the inputs for that modeling? Uh, the input is um, solubility, modeled solubility across physiologically relevant pH range. Uh, since uh, when we are simulating something, we have many data points. So typically, we are extracting uh, the solubility, for example, at pH 1, pH 2, pH 4.5, pH 6.8, pH 7.4 which is uh, conventionally the range that covers physiologically relevant solubility. Um, may maybe I could add to this. Um, the program does include a model that will calculate the full solubility pH profile based on a solubility at one pH, um, pKa's of the compound, and something that's called solubility factors, meaning the but ratio between the ionized, uh, between the solubility of ionized form and neutral form. Uh, the most common practice and the one that we would also recommend is, uh, as uh, Jasmina described, 
uh, taking your solubility data measured in different pH conditions to calibrate this model or at least validate the predictions of pKa's and the solubility factors and then continue using that for the simulations so that the because you are not going to be measuring solubility at every single pH that the compound encounters in the intestine right? you pick several key pH conditions as Jasmine I described and then you would let the model to interpolate between these um, for, for all the other pH conditions Thank you, Vera. Thank you, Vera. Um, I guess the next question you probably already addressed earlier, this is uh, about the PPTK modeling. For the pharmacokinetic part, did you use the compartmental analysis of PPTK? I believe you answered that. You said it depends on the compound. For the nonlinear PK, you will only use the PPTK model. Is that right? That's correct, yeah. Uh, actually, whenever um, I'm doing modeling, I see what is it is uh, on case by case basis. You see, when you have data, uh, what works well for you, and the software offers both possibilities. So it is entirely up to you uh, to decide how you are going to approach something. Mm. Thanks. The next question, for the BCS1 molecule, how was the IVFC model validated? Was external validation used? Uh, no, in this case, internal validation was sufficient. Uh, as I presented in that slide with the um, table with uh, validation results, all the values for prediction, percent prediction error for both parameters uh, were below 10%. Criterion is less than 15 for individual and mean uh, less than 10%. Uh, if mean less than 10% is achieved uh, by doing internal validation, no external validation is required. And that is as per guidance document published by FDA in 1997. That guidance document is still valid. So in the case that prediction error uh, were higher, uh, we would need external validation. Thank you. The next question, were the post-marketing changes approved without clinical data? Uh, no. Actually, we believed, uh, I think that it is about the example four. We believe that the change that we did is justifiable because we consider it as minor change and we observed no, um, no impact on dissolution across physiologically relevant pH range. But according to the agency, and that change is considered to be major change and the agency ask for bio study or agency offer as option unless you can justify it by IV IVC. So we started to work on our IV IVC. We developed method and we approach it uh, in the way as I described for the example four and now we are waiting for the agency. Thank you. The next question, if the formulation contained, uh, contains IR plus ER, it is possible to develop a level A correlation? Oh, that is something I haven't experienced yet uh, to that level. I tried to do something by using that multiple mode dosing, and maybe Vera has some experience with that. So, um, to you know, in theory, there is no reason why it should not be possible. And within within Gastro Plus, you actually would have a couple of different options. One, as uh, Yasmina mentioned, you could use the mixed multiple dose feature that allows you to simultaneously administer the IR and ER portion, or you could simply use the uh, dissolution profile. Right? If you have IR and ER uh, combination your dissolution profile will reflect that by having the initial burst very quickly uh, from the IR formulation followed by the ER portion of it. So, you know, 
there is no reason why that should not be possible in the same way as you would be developing IVIVC for any ER formulations. You just have a little bit more complex uh, dissolution profile. Thank you. Um, the next question is referred to the earlier examples you gave um, about this BCS1 molecule. Was the mid strength for BCS1 molecule weaver affected by agency? Uh, uh, the, que the question was, uh, was the intermediate strength accepted by a waiver? Yes. 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 Well, the answer is yes. All right. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, the next question, is PPPK modeling used for um, checking the similarity for local acting drugs? Uh, I haven't experienced something like that. Um, in my site, we are dealing mainly with uh, solid oral dosage forms. Um, but I think that it would be possible because it is based, uh, when we are doing uh, physiologically based PK modeling, uh, we are taking into account concentration of the drug in systemic circulation or PK profile of the drug, we are taking into account uh, physiological parameters. In this case, it would not be uh, gastrointestinal tract parameters because drug is delivered via, let's say, skin. So I see no reason why not, but it might be done with some other module of gastroplast, not this module that I'm using right now, and also Vera may not know. Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to add to that. So for locally acting drug, it depends you know depending on where and um, where you want the the drug to be acting. I mean, we have seen some of the requests or cases where the sponsor companies were interested in evaluating locally acting drugs in the intestine, right? So it would still be uh, using the ICAD model, and the uh, the beauty of the this physiological based PK modeling and the mechanistic absorption modeling is that you can assess the concentrations at different regions, so either in intestine or in different tissues, and and so on. Um, the more tricky part would come from the validation of the model. Right? For example, if you have a um, um, orally administered drug that's acting in the intestine and it's not being absorbed, right? You don't have that easily accessible plasma concentration time profile to validate the model. So you would have to find different ways of actually measuring the concentrations at the, at the uh, site of action to validate the model or show that some surrogate concentration or, or metric is sufficient. But, you know, in technically, you shouldn't have problem using that with PVPK. The only issue is with possible validation if uh, the compound is not making it into the plasma and you don't have easy access to that measurement. Thank you, Vera. Um, the next question, what is the regulatory agency's views on the validation of the PPPK modeling? Because generic generally does not have enough in-house generated the data for validating the model? Um, uh, in our experience, the regulatory agencies are started to be more open towards that approach. And uh, if it is justified appropriately, I think that it is supported by the regulatory agency. Okay, thank you. The next question. Would it make more sense to determine pH-dependent solubility in acetate or HCl or phosphate, or using bio-relevant dissolution media like passive or phosphate at different pH? Yes, yes, it definitely makes more sense because by using uh, bio-relevant media, actually, we, uh, depending also what we are. Uh, Assuming as bio-relevant media, if bio-relevant media contains a factant, uh, such as bile salts, 
at concentration that corresponds uh, to uh, the one that is likely to be observed in human gastrointestinal tract and then measuring solubility in bioindicative media definitely has uh, its value. Um, but in most of the situations because of time and simplicity uh, our lab is generating data in conventional media um, but it would be it would be beneficial, especially for some molecules where it is critical uh, to have data in biorelevant media. Um, if I could add to to that a, a quick comment, um, when you look at the intestine, um, the pH as well as the bile salt concentrations are changing in different regions of the intestine. Right. So in ideal case, you would want to calibrate the effect of both effect of pH as well as the effect of bile salt concentrations. So, and to do that, you would actually want to have both sets of measurements using uh, solubilities in just pure buffers at different pHs to calibrate your model to account for the effect of changing pH on the solubility of the compound. And then have also passive or festive or both, but at least one of those to add the calibration for binding or for partitioning to the biosold micelles so that you can properly account for both effects. Now, there are compounds where you could get away with one, right? Um, let's say if it's a polar molecule which you don't expect partitioning to biosold micelles at all, uh, you would go into um, with just the buffer media. If it's very lipophilic, but uh, neutral molecule or molecule with the PKAs far away from the um, physiological region, you might get away with just the uh, bioelement media. But in a general case, you would want to have both to properly calibrate both effects. Thank you, Vera. Thank you. Um, the next question. The simulations showing are um, mainly fasting state studies. Did you do similar IVFC for fat state? Considering uh, agency recommendation for XR dosage form both the fasting and the fat. Uh, most of our simulations are for fasted state. And if it is known that food has no significant impact on drug bio viability and bioequivalence, and then a fasted uh, state is acceptable. It would be challenged, I guess, in situations when a food has significant impact on bioviability by equivalence. And by changing from fasted uh, to fed state, uh, we are also uh, introducing more variables. So for IVIVC, in my experience, it is uh, more straightforward if we can work with fasted conditions. Uh, switching from fasted to fed may be useful during early development and development stage uh, to evaluate uh, possible impact of food on drug behavior in the body. Thank you. The next question is, what is the strategy that you used for validating the PPPK model for your generic drug products? Did you use acceptance criteria other than IBIVC acceptance criteria? If so, could you please give an example? I think that, um, uh, in my uh, in my opinion, I think that I explained it, I illustrated how we started. We have to have formulations with different release rates. And we have to have biodata for those formulations. Biodata, I mean plasma concentration versus time data. Uh, we have to have the solution uh, that is generated in bioindicative medium. Bioindicative medium is medium that differentiates between uh, slow, medium, and fast formulations, um, and uh, differences are reflection of uh, PK differences. So we have to have a set of data, PK data and in vitro data. And then uh, 
we are putting those data into correlation. Correlation model can be different, can be linear as it was observed for VCS class 1 drug or can be non-linear. And then uh, we have to validate the model. Once when we have the model, IVIVC model, uh, we have to go back and to test if when we, if we put the solution data for that particular formulation that is involved into modeling, if it would result in the PK profile and PK parameters that are matching the observed values. That is our internal validation. If necessary, we should perform external validation with the formulation that has not been involved in model development. And this is pretty much uh, the same as explained in the regulatory guidance document for IVIVC development and validation. Thank you. Um, one question for Avira. Do you have example of VE waiver by agency based on the virtual BE from any of your generic clients? Um, this is the person from mm -hmm. Sandals. Yeah, um, this is a, a, a tricky question. You know, clearly we don't hear about every single case that um, the users of GastroPlus might have submitted to the FDA. One that uh, I can think of that would be the closest one is it wasn't for a generic uh, client. It was a biowaiver based uh, waiver of a bridging study. And um, you have seen the presentation uh, by um, um, Christoph from J&J &J showing um, the um, inclusion of the BE simulations to avoid the bridging study when something changed in the formulation and the particle size specifications have changed. Um, another one we actually worked on a um, few months ago and it is right now at the review for, for at the FDA where it was a um, BE waiver uh, um, but um, it's uh, it's still in the in, in the review. Uh, we haven't heard back yet. I'm not yeah. sure if you know. I know that John is online. I'm not sure if he can think of any others, but uh, that would be what I can think of for the generic uh, generic companies or similar applications. Thank you. I saw a couple people raising their hands. I'm going to. Um, um, Go there. Uh, I'm mute. Um, there is. Uh, uh, let's see here. Marietta Romick, you have raised your hand. You have a question. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Okay, um, both Marietta and Ravi actually already had also submitted the questions, so maybe those were answered. And the Ravi, Ravi Sa? Yes. You still have a question? No, I'm done. I have, I, I'm done with the questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And uh, there's one Hata. Hata. Oh, Hitasha, do you, do you have any questions? You had um, maybe your question was answered in the meantime. Uh, it was answered. Okay. Oh, that's very good. Okay. All right. Um, I think we've gone through all the questions so far. Um, and if I do not see any more questions coming up, which is good. well, there's one here. If a drug has different polymorph with different bioavailability, can it model? For drug uh, has different polym um, uh, uh, crystalline polymorph with different bioavailability, hmm. uh, then I guess that. Um, the reason why different polymers have different bioviability is uh, 
difference in the solubility between the polymers? Yeah, so I guess the, the answer to that question is if you can characterize the differences between those polymorphs, you can include them in the model and look at the, at the predictions. But um, you have to know the differences in, um, in physical properties for the polymorphs um, in order to account for it. Thank you. Um, here's one more question. Is it possible to do PPPK modeling for prodrugs? Yes. I think so, yeah. Yes, yes, you, you, yeah, you can do the modeling from prodrugs, and we have done uh, done some cases of the prodrug modeling. In fact, uh, one of the cases was published just maybe a couple months ago in uh, AAPS journal where we were modeling uh, valsite administration, where valsite as uh, valgancyclovir is being administered, and the drug gencyclovir itself is being formed in vivo and the active drug. So that would be one example that was just published for that application. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess this is the same question they further expand. I saw it having polymorph exhibit different solubility profile. Yeah, so. Um, so that, that is an expansion on the polymorphs. Um, let's say if the drug changes the form in the intestine, um, so you are administering it as, as one polymorph, but then it precipitates a different one. Um, we don't have a way of directly defining right now um, where you could specify different solubility for your initial administered compound and the precipitate. There are some workarounds that we have used in the past um, by adjusting some of the possible redissolution parameters or changing the dissolution of the of, um, initially administered form. So there are some workarounds that we have used for these kinds of cases. You cannot do it by directly defining the solubilities yet. Um, it is something that is fairly high on our list of priorities um, for future improvements of GastroPlus. For now, as I said, we have um, some workarounds that could be applied. Um, the best is um, just contact us when you have a specific case to explain different options. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Yasmina, and also Vera, um, for the um, for the presentation and answering questions. In case you have additional questions for the audience after the webinar, um, please you can go to our GastroPlus user group LinkedIn website where you can post your questions. Your questions will be addressed by our members or members in Simulations Plus. So um, now um, we're getting closer to the end of the, the, the time. And thank you again, Yasmina, as well as uh, uh, Vera for uh, answering the questions for the great presentation. For the audience, thank you all for your participation. You may now disconnect from the webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.